Alright, today is Thursday, the 2nd of June, and this is a recap for the stock market activities today. Folks, I got a good one for you tonight, and let's start by this. A lot of you put two and two together. The guy was absent for about five days over the Memorial Day weekend, and Mr. Paul Pelosi also got arrested with a DUI. Maybe the Maverick of Wall Street is actually Mr. Pelosi, and I say you got me. I am Mr. Paul Pelosi. I'm married to Nancy, and uh, please help me. But next time, I'm going to use a better excuse here. Like this one, for example. Right now in the United Kingdom, they have uh, the Jubilee, whatever that is. And every time there's an occasion where the royal family gets together, all of a sudden Prince Andrew gets the thing. <coughs> I got the thing again. This is the 19th time he gets the thing. So next time, I'm just going to say that I got the thing. And that explains my uh, rest. I mean, my absence. And hey, look at this. You may be not nailing the stock market right now. It goes up, it goes down. Nobody knows what's going on. You're losing money, but here it is. If you went broke, if you lost everything, that's okay because billionaire Ray Dalio says that going broke was the best thing that ever happened to him. Maybe that explains why he bought AMC and GameStop. Anyways, we got a lot to talk about here. So let's move on and here it is in focus tonight. Hurricane, says gangster Jamie Dimon from the laundromat of J.P. Morgan. And I know we get a lot of viewers, new viewers all the time, and they say, why do you call it the laundromat? Well, let's go through a brief history of the laundromat J.P. Morgan. And of course, uh, gangster Jamie says that he's not woke. Uh, he's a red-blooded capitalist. He he's a good American. He doesn't believe in stakeholder capitalism and all of that crap. Uh, let me fix this one for you, Mr. Diamond. It's not red-blooded capitalist. It's a red-blooded criminal. Of course, he says he's not woke, but when it was convenient to take a knee down and pretend that he cares about black folks, he did that exactly. But in reality, J.P. Morgan's practices, they discriminate against black people all the time. Black doctor sues J.P. Morgan Chase, alleging she was refused service at Texas branch because of race. Of course, we all remember how many black families J.P. Morgan screwed up back in the housing crisis of 2008-2009. But we call it the laundromat because, well, they got caught washing money over and over and over again. Nobody washes money better than J.P. Morgan. Matter of fact, if you got any dirty money, drug money, any criminal money, give it to Jamie Diamond. He'll wash it for you, fold it, clean it, iron it, no charge. Well, maybe a little charge under the table, of course. But here it is. I'm going to read some headlines for you, and you tell me. Is this a bank or is this a criminal organization? The largest criminal organization in the United States of America. Matter of fact, Al Capone is rolling in his grave right now, wishing. Why didn't I think of this? I should have been a bankster instead of a gangster. You know, the good old capitalist American way to commit crimes. You commit your crime and the government gives you a little slap on the wrist, hey, don't do it again, on oh, pay a fine, a small fine, a couple of hundred millions, and then do it again, no problem. Just make sure you pay us again. But if you and I, regular folks, if we steal a candy bar, oh, we're gonna get arrested. Unless if you're in San Francisco, of course, then you have the 900 bucks cap. If you steal anything under 900 bucks, that's okay. But here it is, I'm gonna read headlines for you and you tell me, is this a bank or is this the biggest mafia organization in the country? The headline reads, J.P. Morgan allegedly helped Russian mafia launder funds. This is according to the FinCEN revelations. J.P. Morgan seriously breached money laundering rules, Swiss regulator says. Here it is, the FinCEN revelations. Global banks defy U.S. crackdowns by serving oligarchs, criminals, and terrorists. Watch that money, baby. Here's a deal in Nigeria. J.P. Morgan staff said a 1.1 billion deal might be corrupt. The bank sent the money anyway. Another one. Exclusive. J.P. Morgan faces oil bribery probe in Brazil. Another one. J.P. Morgan Chase unit to pay $250 million penalty over poor internal controls. Another one, J.P. Morgan hit by $200 million fines for letting employees use WhatsApp to evade regulators' reach. So the regulators are watching the communication at J.P. Morgan because it is a criminal organization, and to evade the authorities, they're communicating via WhatsApp instead. Here it is from the SEC, J.P. Morgan Securities admits the manipulative trading in the U.S. treasuries. So they're manipulating the treasury market. It's not just money laundering. They got market manipulation too. 
the Department of Justice fined J.P. Morgan $920 million for rigging the precious metals and commodities market in the U.S. So if you're wondering why gold and silver have been repressed in value, it's because of this. Matter of fact, the U.S. government labeled J.P. Morgan's precious metals trading disk as a crime ring, accusing it of a racketeering operation. Another one. U.S. charges another ex-J.P. Morgan executive with alleged market manipulation. Whistleblower helps government reach $614 million mortgage fraud settlement with J.P. Morgan in yet another mortgage fraud case. It doesn't stop here, folks. J.P. Morgan is defrauding its own customers. They're stealing from, from their own customers. Chase bankers charged in $400,000 theft from elderly and dead customers. Matter of fact, at 93 a grandma got defrauded by J.P. Morgan Chase and she sued them back and she won. Here's another one. J.P. Morgan Chase employee accused of stealing $100,000 from customer with Alzheimer's. Wow. J.P. Morgan Chase Bank wrongly charged 170,000 customers overdraft fees. Federal regulators refused to penalize it. It's the American way, baby. Crime is legal here. Another one. A J.P. Morgan banker is accused of stealing customers' identities and $1.1 million in cash. Another one. Former J.P. Morgan executive arrested in Argentina for embezzling about $5.4 million from clients. Two J.P. Morgan Chase bankers in Brooklyn indicted for stealing $400,000 from customers who are elderly or deceased. The FBI exposes employees' accounts draining scam at J.P. Morgan. And even the Islamic unit at J.P. Morgan also got caught in Dubai conducting fraud. Here it is. A cargo ship owned by J.P. Morgan Chase seized by U.S. with 20 tons of cocaine worth about $1.5 billion. Again, I mean, is this a bank or is this the biggest mafia organization, the biggest criminal organization in the country? And of course, here it is. J.P. Morgan says it is hiring thousands of individuals with criminal backgrounds amid the labor shortage. Oh, really? Is it the labor shortage or is it because you need criminals? The business model of J.P. Morgan is crime. Of course you need criminals to design the next crime scheme. And here's the, the latest one. And it's really stunning. You gotta read this one. It is a culture of intimidation by gangster Jamie Dimon at J.P. Morgan. J.P. Morgan employees describe growing paranoia as the company tracks their office attendance, calls, calendars, and more, with one worker even installing a mouse jiggler to evade Big Brother. And J.P. Morgan employees right now cracking jokes. And they're not really jokes. They're afraid about 1984, Big Brother, this is what's going on with J.P. Morgan right now. So yes, when I say it's the laundromat, I'm being mild and nice. It's actually more criminal than that. But of course, everybody's talking about the statement from the Capo di Capi, the top gangster, Jamie Dimon, describing a hurricane that is about to hit the economy. But remember this, last year, J.P. Morgan chief says or sees a boom coming. Jamie Dimon sees a boom in the economy. Maybe a kaboom, because that's what's going on right now. And even as... Late as January of this year, Jamie Dimon sees the best economic growth in decades. Really? Jamie Dimon added, the economy continues to do quite well, despite headwinds related to the Pokemon variant, inflation, and supply chain bottlenecks. Jamie Dimon also said that J.P. Morgan Chase closed out the year with record $48.3 billion in profits. Fast forward to the first quarter of this year. Here it is. J.P. Morgan's pandemic boom ended with a 42% drop in quarterly profit. The bank is budgeting for loan losses as she, CEO Jamie Dimon sees challenges with inflation. Matter of fact, earlier last month, on May 4th, Jamie Dimon said this, the Cold War is back and a recession is a real possibility. And then when the stock market went down, when his stock went down, he came out on May 23rd and said, JP Morgan jumps 8% after the bank raises interest rate income guidance by $3 billion. And CEO Jamie Dimon talks up strength of the consumer. Matter of fact, JP Morgan says US consumer are doing just fine. Nothing to see here and about a couple of weeks ago maybe last week jamie diamond came out and said that the u.s economy remains strong and potential obstacles to growth are not set in stone matter of fact he said the storm clouds over the u.s economy may dissipate fast forward to this week and this is what jamie diamond said it's a hurricane it's we, right now it's kind of sunny things are doing fine you know everyone thinks the, the fed can handle this 
that hurricane is right out there down the road coming our way. We just don't know if it's a minor one or Superstorm Sandy or uh, yeah, Sandy or or uh, Andrew or something like that. And it's you, you better brace yourself. So let's just admit that Jamie Dimon would make a shitty meteorologist if Jamie Dimon says it's going to be sunny at 80 degrees. You might want to wear shorts and go to the beach. It's probably going to be a Category 5 hurricane. Maybe it's time for Mr. Dimon to retire and buy the IHOP chain instead because he likes flip-flopping pancakes, just like his opinions. But I'm going to help you here, Mr. Dimon. You're right. There is a hurricane coming, and it's going to smash this economy. And it is not just a Category 5. It's Category 6, maybe 10. We'll make up a category. Because here's what's going on in this economy that nobody wants to talk about. By now, everybody knows that inflation is absolutely insane. The biggest inflation since the 1970s, perhaps. The biggest inflation in this country's history. But of course, we're not going to know that because the cooks at the Bureau of Labor Statistics, they cook the CPLI and they give us fake readings. But we know what's going on in this economy. Rent inflation alone is about 50%. And you might have heard this because this is just stunning. It caused a lot of chaos on Twitter yesterday. Bloomberg says, worried about inflation? Question mark. Well, more than one in three Americans earning at least 250 grand annually say they're living paycheck to paycheck. Yep. Among the millennial generation specifically, 63% of those earnings 100 grand to 150 grand say that they're living paycheck to paycheck. 57% of those earnings 150 to 200 grand say that they're living paycheck to paycheck. And about 50% of those earnings 200 grand to 250 grand say that they're living paycheck to paycheck. Those are millennials, of course. And then you got those earning $250,000 or more. More than 55% of those say that they're living paycheck to to paycheck. Why? Of course, a lot of the commentators say, oh, these people are living beyond, beyond their means, and that explains that. Wrong. Think about it. These millennials who are earning over 100 grand and over 250 grand, where do you think these people work? You're not going to make 250 grand flipping burgers at Burger King. You're making this kind of salary because you're working in the tech industry. Where is that located? The answer is here in the used to be great state of California, specifically in Northern California, where housing prices are absolutely insane. Rents are absolutely insane. Not to mention taxes. If you're earning over 100 grand here in California, you're paying at least 50% taxes. On top of that, you got insane rent, insane mortgages, insane child care cost, schooling. So what happens is, yes, these tech workers are earning 250 grand, but effectively, their salaries are actually 50 grand or less when you factor in inflation and the insane cost of living here in California, not to mention the insane taxation. In other words, in this economy, you're better off being poor than rich because the more you earn, the more you're going to pay in taxes and the more you're going to pay in rents, mortgage. And these are going higher by the day. The living cost, specifically housing cost in this state of California is absolutely stunning. You have rents rising by 100% doubling year over year. Nobody's talking about that. But we all see that in the ground. We all know what's going on here. The CPLI says rent inflation is up 4% year over year. Are you kidding me? So no, these people are not living beyond their means. These people effectively, the take-home salary after you factor in inflation, the cost of living, taxes, they're actually earning 60 grand or less. And this explains why they're living paycheck to paycheck. And now we got the manager of George Soros Fortune, who says a recession is inevitable. But the markets may be wrong about how it looks. Well, it's going to look ugly, that's for sure. No matter how many plastic surgeries it's going to get, there is no Juvederm that's going to fix that ugliness. But the category of the hurricane depends on the action by the Federal Reserve. If the Fed acts now, it's going to be Category 3. If the Fed waits and hopes that inflation is still transitory, then this stagflation will persist. And by the time they start to increase in interest rates, it will be category 100. And I don't know if you caught it or not in the morning, but Governor Braindead from the Fed was on CNBC today and she said, remember Boystick from Atlanta kept saying, oh, maybe the Fed is going to pause by September. But now Braindead came out and said that inflation has yet to peak and it's too soon to say that it is peaking. The only thing peaking Mrs. Brain Dead is the growth in the economy, not inflation, and hence we have stagflation. But most importantly, Mrs. Brain Dead said that she does not support a pause of interest rate hikes in September. Now keep that in mind. Interest rates are going higher. And this will become relevant in this conversation in a minute. But remember Paul Volcker, legendary Fed president or Fed chairman Paul Volcker? 
who solved the inflation problem back in the 1970s, 1980s? Well, if you studied inflation back then, you know that inflation doesn't go away on its own. And even after the Fed acts and starts increasing interest rates dramatically, Above the CPI, it takes time. It takes sometimes months, if not years, before inflation comes down. So right now, the, the effective Fed funds rate is at around 1%. The CPI is at 8.5%, and hence the Fed is way behind the curve. They need to get that rate above the CPI to tackle inflation effectively. And even if that happens, it might take months, if not years before inflation comes down. And here's what's going on in this economy, folks. As inflation surges out of control, what's going on? Remember the strong consumer. Don't worry about the economy. The consumer is strong. Bullshit. And we called it bullshit a year ago. Now, the savings rate in the United States of America, the consumer savings rate, is at the lowest level since the financial crisis. Look at this. All of these savings, poof gone. It's going to get worse. Why? Because inflation keeps going higher and higher and higher. Matter of fact, now we have CEOs warning that U.S. households are burning through savings at an alarming rate, and they could run out within months. Wow, we're already seeing that, folks. We're seeing consumers running out of savings. We're already seeing this right now, not months from now. So what happens when you run out of savings? The answer is you swipe those credit cards up and down, up and down, up and down. And here it is. Consumer debt soared by $52 billion in March alone. Wow. The headline from the New York Times reads, They got the debt, but not the degree. Even folks without a college degree are taking an insane, reckless amount of debt. The American consumer lost their mind, and you can't blame them really because inflation is killing us. So the last resort is to swipe those credit cards up and down, up and down, up and down. Americans have opened the record. 11 and a half million credit card accounts in the first two months of 2022. According to data from credit card reporting firm Aquifax, Equifax, whatever the hell that is, credit limits on those new cards totaled $55.5 billion, up nearly 60% from the same period last year. Retail sales data has already shown Americans spending more than ever through April. The Aquifax report suggests the spending spree has room to run. The timing, however, listen to this, the timing, however, could not be worse. The Federal Reserve is squarely in inflation fighting mode, with policymakers expected to back double-sized rate hikes in June and July. Those increases lift borrowing costs throughout the economy, including through higher credit card rates. The average card rate sits at 16.41%, according to bank rate. And mind you, by the way, 1641 when the Fed funds rate is at zero. Can you imagine what credit card rates are going to shoot up to when the Fed finally raises interest rates above 8% if that ever happens? Brace yourself indeed, but the Fed's battle against inflation could drive it to all time highs. The Fed's rate hike cycle could push that average to well over 18%. Ted Roseman, senior industry analyst at Bankrate, said in a note that is above the April 2019 record of 17.87%. At the consumer level, that represents much higher bar to clear for Americans paying off high balances. The average credit card balance is $5,525. Listen to this. And it could take 195 months to pay that off by making the minimum payment with 16.41% rate, Roseman said. It would also cost about six. 6276 bucks in interest. Now, at an 18.91% rate, it would take that consumer six more months and another 1040 bucks in interest payments to pay off the balance. Are you paying attention or not? As the Fed continues to increase interest rates and they have to do even more, that credit card balance is going to continue to move higher. And on top of that, you're going to pay a higher interest rate on that balance. This is a recipe for an upcoming epic disaster in the economy. The headline from USA Today says, I exhausted my savings. Inflation has Americans turning to loans, credit cards to cope. Does it pose big risks? Question mark. No, it's not. Everybody's going to pay their debts magically. And we're going to go to the beach and slurp pina coladas. No problems here at all. But here's the problem, folks. What happens after you exhaust your credit card balance? So now you exhausted your savings. That's gone. Poof. So you swipe those credit cards up and down, up and down, up and down. And now you max the credit card. What do you do next to cope with this inflation? The answer is the scam of buy now, pay later or never. Matter of fact, the percentage of Americans who have used buy now, pay later during the last two years, look at this. Among Gen Zers, 
59% used pay now or buy now, pay later or never last year. 58% so far used the service this year. Among millennials in 2022, 54% are using buy now, pay later. Among Gen Xers, 44%. And among boomers, seniors, 20 2% are using buy now, pay later. This is a recipe for an epic upcoming disaster in this economy. You can't even make it up. And consumers are using buy now, pay later, not to buy iPhones or buy concert tickets. They're actually using that for vet services for their animals and dental care. Shame on us, folks, the richest country in the world. We can afford sending $40, $50 billion to Ukraine to fund the proxy war, regardless of how many civilians are dying right now. But we cannot afford health care in this country. Country. Folks have to rack in debt for basic dental care, and the disaster becomes even more heartbreaking when it comes to vets. We're not talking about military vets, we're talking about doctors, animal doctors. Because a lot of folks adopted animals, cats, dogs, during the pandemic, the thing, and now it's becoming increasingly difficult and costly to maintain the health care and medical costs for these dogs and cats. Good luck, by the way, finding a vet appointment right now. I'm trying to find an appointment for mine, and the earliest one available is September. This is how insane the demand is. So unfortunately, and this is the heartbreaking part, we're seeing a lot of folks abandoning their animals, the shelters, oh, they're getting packed right now. And this crisis is going to get even worse. And this, this is what's going on in this economy. The delinquency rate in small ticket personal loans, this is the buy now, pay later, 5K and less, 20%, 5K to 10K, 24% delinquency rate, 10K to 15K, 15% delinquency rate, 15K to 25K, 14%, and then we have 25 to 50K, that is a delinquency rate of 9%. Unbelievable. The economy is falling apart and they say, oh, this time around it's different because we don't have the reckless risk taking that we saw back in the housing crisis. Are you? kidding me what is this what do you call this this is the mother of all bubbles this is the most insane risk taking that we've ever seen before listen to this over 40 percent of shoppers have made a late payment using buy now pay later that is an awful lot of people the wall street journal says buy now pay later companies such as a firm after paying Klarna, promised the credit revolution that would change the way people pay for things. Rising delinquencies and a slowing economy are clouding that outlook. Now watch out here, folks. The Bureau of Consumer Protection. I believe his name is, uh, what's his name? Chopra. Listen to what he says. It's also seeing consumers taking on more debt, increasing credit card balances, and turning to the fast-growing buy now, pay later market to afford purchases. He says those newer products are clouding the overall outlook for consumer credit. One challenge is that creditors and other buy now pay later companies don't even necessarily know how many other buy now pay later products you've taken on. We're also seeing it enter the brick and mortar space. Um, some people have even reported you can even buy food and groceries with it. The CFPB has ordered the major buy now pay later companies to provide more information about their business plans and practices. The key piece is to make sure that we're not creating a system that uh, you know, sends people into a spiral of debt that they ultimately cannot repay. Under typical credit card laws and regulations, um, there is a way in which credit card companies have to go through some basic protocols to make sure that you can repay the loan. Chopra says he wants consumers to understand the risk and have a basic level of protection, Kelly. Now, older viewers in this channel, remember when we talked about the hidden accelerator in the economy, meaning we could see a recession, a mini crash, but there is a hidden accelerator that will morph that mini crash into a massive economic collapse, the likes that we've never seen before. Could this be the hidden accelerator, the insane amount, reckless debt taking and in this case with the buy now pay later we don't even have the data on how bad it is but the stock market knows what's going on look at the stock of affirm for example it went down by over 90 percent be careful here this company could go bankrupt because we don't know what's hiding we don't know how ugly the picture is but perhaps this is a clue the wall street journal says more subprime borrowers are missing loan payments. Uh-oh. Haven't we learned anything from 2008, 2009, folks? This is deja vu all over again. But this time around, 
it is on a larger scale, much larger. Here's another one that could be the hidden accelerator. U.S. car sales at a recessionary levels as inflation, rising interest rates, concern increase. Now, you might say, oh, used cars prices are going to go down. Uh -uh -uh. We have a massive shortage in new cars. Why? Due to the EV lunacy. Every single company scrapped their um, combustion engine assembly lines and they opted for EVs. Well, where are the EVs? They're not coming out anytime soon due to the insane shortages of ships, many other materials. And this is pushing the average price of an EV to well above $60,000. So the market for used cars is still going to be hot, but we're not seeing activities. We're not seeing more buying, taking of loans anymore. Why? Because it's getting really expensive to do so when we have inflation at the gas pump when we have inflation at the grocery store rents utilities consumers are foregoing these large ticket items but prices are now going down due to the shortages and hence we have stagflation but this this is really dangerous the auto abs sales these are the bonds backed by car loans have reached multi-year highs almost 60 billion dollars worth gold telegraph says bonds backed by car loans are selling at fastest pace in years listen to this Corporations have sold more than $58 billion of asset-backed securities supported by auto loans this year. What can possibly go wrong? Folks, this is the housing crisis all over again. This is deja vu all over again. Haven't we learned anything from the disaster of 2008, 2009? I bet you all of these loans, asset-backed loans, when Michael Burry does the homework, He's going to find the next big short because this is what's going on. Subprime car loan defaults hit an all-time high in February. Uh-oh. Here we go again, folks. Here we go. We haven't learned a damn thing. It's going to happen again. And this time, the Fed will be out of ammo. There is no rescue when this crash happens. So yes, as Jamie Dimon says, brace yourself and it's time to wake up. Anyways, we have to move on and cover the stock market for you. We start with the performance of indices today and here we go. The Dow Industrial Average closing in the green big time by 435.5 points or a gain of 1.33%. The Nasdaq up in the green by 322.44 points or a gain of 2.69%. The S&P 500 also in the green by 75.59 points or a gain of 1.84%. The sector's performances all in the green with exception of energy. Interesting. We'll see how long that's going to last. But a number one capturing the gold medal cyclicals number two for the silver technology number three for the bronze communication services the advance to decline ratio believe it or not the breadth actually improved dramatically in today's session because the nyse got 80 percent advancing versus 17 percent declining the nasdaq 75 percent advancing versus 21 percent declining but i want you to look at the 52 week highs we got 30 of those in the nasdaq today 58 in the nyse now yes we got 90 new 52 week lows in the Nasdaq, but this is an improvement when we look at past sessions. We'll see how long this is going to last, but the payroll reports that we're about to get tomorrow in the morning will dictate whether this bounce is going to last or not. Moving on to commodities. Look at this green across the board for the most part. Crude was up big with the WTI gains of almost 2%. Brent was up by a little over 1.5%. The RBOB gasoline was up big, almost 4%. No relief at the pump at all. And then we have heating oil continues to surge higher by over 3% today. The loser of the day was natural gas down by a little over 3%. Now, when we talk about energy, crude was higher, even though we got the news that Joe Biden, remember that Joe Biden called Saudi Arabia a pariah? Well, now MBS is laughing his ass off because right now Joe Biden is on his knees begging MBS to pump more oil. And now Biden is planning a trip to Saudi Arabia immediately. The begging tour continues. And of course, OPEC Plus announced a 50% increase in the oil output for July and August. So this takes the 460 barrels worth of increase to about 600,000 barrels. And this is only for July and August. Of course, Joe Biden wants to see a little more than that. And hence the begging tour to Saudi Arabia. Not Houston, by the way, not Alaska, not Oklahoma, not even Canada, because I believe when the Saudis pump more oil, that doesn't harm the environment. But when you pump from Houston or Alaska or North Dakota, that tends to harm the environment a little more. 
don't you think? Anyways, the US immediately praised the OPEC Plus decision in Saudi Arabia for accelerating oil hikes, but here's the catch, and I explained this to you in yesterday's video. The net net volume will remain the same, and it's actually going to go down due to the embargo against Russian oil. So the Saudis are not pumping more oil to help Joe Biden. The Saudis are pumping more oil because they can capture more profits by doing so. Hence, pumping more oil is not good news for the consumer. It's certainly good news for Saudi Arabia because they can increase the state revenue, but you're not going to see relief at the pump anytime soon. Case in point, what happened today in crude oil futures, they did not go down. Matter of fact, they responded by popping higher. And by the way, it's not just MBS who's laughing his ass off. Remember uh, Putin? Sticking it to Putin, brah? Well, here's your update. <laughs> Sticking it to Putin, bro. <laughs> Russia is on track to make more money off oil and gas exports this year than it did in 2021, and it's got the EU to thank. The EU wanted to stick it to Putin by banning Russian oil. What do you know? The Russians are making more money now. But here's this one that's gonna scare Putin. You better watch out, Putin. We got you. The US goes after more Russian yachts linked to Putin in expanded sanctions. Oh, that's gonna get him, right? Taking the yachts away? We don't even know if it's his yachts or not. We're just gonna take a bunch of yachts. That's gonna show Putin to stop uh, the war, whatever he's doing over there. And I say if Putin ever dies, it's not gonna be from cancer. It's gonna be from laughing his ass off at the stupidity of the West. Anyhow, back to the futures, softs, which was the weak spot in today's session, down across the board, be it mild declines for OJ, coffee, and sugar, yet we have sizable declines of a little over 1% for cocoa, and then a little over 1.5% for lumber, and the gainer of the day, the lone gainer, is cotton, scoring gains of a little over 2% today, a rebound for cotton. Here it is, metals, we thought that the US dollar is going to rebound higher again, perhaps it found a bottom, but the dollar went down today, and what do you know, metals shot up higher. Gold up, silver up, platinum up, copper up, palladium up. Look at copper. We were wondering in yesterday's video, when you have the reopening of China, shouldn't copper go up? And now we know the answer, Dr. Copper closing the day with gains of over 5%. Those of you who have uh, FCX, Freeport McMoran calls, it's steak and lobster, baby. What about meats? Muted day for lean hogs, the new big tech, but we have gains, continuation of the gains for feed or cattle futures, scoring gain for a little over 2%, and then we have modest gains for a little under 1% for live cattle futures. Grains, modest declines for corn and rough rice futures, yet we have sizable losses for canola, losing ground of about one and a quarter percent today. The rest in the green, oats in the green, wheat, soybean oil up big over four percent today, soybean meal, soybeans all closing in the green. So as Mrs. Brain did from the Fed said, inflation is not peaking anytime soon, and you're seeing the evidence right here. Moving on to options, the big casino, what's going on here? The volume is improving slightly, and we're seeing more buying of calls. We're moving from the 50s now to the 60s in the percentage of call options in the overall volume for certain names. So this is a good sign for the sustainability of this rebound. But again, we have the payrolls. The payrolls is a big hiccup, and then we have the CPI next week. Anyhow, Apple came up at number one at around 1 million contracts traded today. About 57% of those were calls. Now, number two, Tesla, the super around 750,000 contracts, about 53.5% of those were calls. And number three, AMD, at around 700,000 contracts, about 58% of those were calls. Moving on to the unusual activities that took place in the options market today. We start with the ticker SNAP Snapchat. They're buying the 17 calls for the expiration date, July 22nd, with expectations. The name could move higher by more than 14% by then. They paid around one buck and 25 cents a piece to enter this trade. All in all, spending around six million dollars and then we have the ticker pins pinterest they're also buying calls in this one in this case the 22 calls for the expiration date july 22nd with expectations the name could move higher by more than 10 percent by then they paid around one buck and 35 cents a piece to enter this trade all in all spending around three million dollars and then we have the ticker double al american airlines in this case they're bidding for for a downside by buying puts the 16 bucks puts for the expiration date july 15th with expectations 
donations. The Denaim could go down by more than 8% by then. They paid around 75 cents apiece to enter this trade, all in all spending around $600,000. And then what about the ticker SPY for the S&P 500? They're buying puts this time around. Somebody's hedging or buying some protection here by buying the 396 puts for the expiration date, June 29th, with expectations. The SPY could go down by more than 5% by then. They paid around 4 bucks and 20 cents apiece to enter this trade, all in all spending around one and a half million dollars. What about the ticker TSLA for Tesla? They're buying calls big time, the 820 calls for the expiration date, June 10th, with expectations that the name could move higher by more than 6% by then. They paid around 14 and a half bucks a piece to enter this trade, all in all spending around five million dollars. Lastly, at the bottom of the table, what about the ticker LLY, Eli Lilly? They bought the 320 calls for the expiration date, August 19th, with expectations that the name could move higher by more than 6% by then. They paid around 13 and a half bucks a piece to enter this trade, all in all spending around three million dollars. Moving on to the heat map analysis, what's going on here? Well, Eli Lilly is down, speaking off, and healthcare was soft, the big pharma names, the risk off kind of names are down along with the defensives names like Kraft Heinz General Mills are down we talked about these names as being bullish not so long ago the charts were looking good these names are defensives they pay high dividends but they went down since then big time after the disaster of Walmart and Target but is this indicative of money coming out of the defensives the risk off kind of names, the big pharma names, the consumer defensives, and even energy, the recent winners. And now all of that money is rotating to the losers. Software, technology, cyclicals, the Chinese names, because these are the kind of names that tended to outperform today. Matter of fact, the experts are attributing the rally in cloud stocks today on the change in investor sentiment. And they're saying that these investors are betting that technology valuations have bottomed for now. Well, we know that more pain has to take place before they actually bottom. But for now, we have a technical rebound. We have certain names that are severely oversold and hence the rally. Now, that doesn't mean that this is the bottom, but it means that this is a bear market rally. And it's going to last for a little while, sucking more people in, and then we see more declines to come. And the news that we got today, and th this is really important, you got to pay attention here. Microsoft came out in the morning and they said that their profit guidance should go down due to the currency impact fact meaning the higher dollar is hurting Microsoft's earnings, the bottom line is going down. Now, the entirety of the stock market was trading down in the morning, along with Microsoft, and then the dip buyers showed up big time. The Qs was trading in the green, the SPY was trading in the green, we've seen names like Tesla up by more than 5%, yet Microsoft was still in the red. Now, that gave us traders an opportunity to buy calls. Why? Because everything is trading higher, the algos are buying, yet Microsoft is down. And the reason is the high US dollar. Well, recently the dollar went down, and today the dollar was down. So you put two and two together, it is just a matter of time before Microsoft catches up with the rally and starts to move higher. So this was an opportunity on a silver platter to buy call options on Microsoft. If you did, you scored big. Now, a lot of you say, why don't you start a Discord? I don't do any of that shit. You got to start spotting these opportunities as they happen you got to start developing these skills reading what the market is saying reading where the opportunities lie in real time and take action accordingly what about the heat map for the etfs here it is a sea of green with exception of the inverse indices of course the vix proxies and energy the winner for the year is down. Is this the beginning of the rotation out of energy into technology, into the beaten down sectors of the stock market? Perhaps. But again, we have another hiccup that could happen from the payrolls tomorrow in the morning. And then we have the CPI. So this could be a technical rebound for now, a summer rally, maybe a June rally. But we haven't seen enough evidence to say that this rotation is legitimate, at least for now. We talk about growth versus value, both in the green, but growth is at performing value. We talk about commodities all in the green with exception of gas, the UNG. But look at gold. The GDX, for example, for gold miners was up big by more than 4% today. When we talk about international markets, all in the green, led by the Chinese ETFs, when we have days of risk on, when growth outperforms value, the Chinese ETFs tend to outperform. Moving on to the charts analysis, and we start with SPY, the S&P 500, 30 minutes chart. In the morning, the indices were down. This chart is no exception. They all went down, but then it formed a double bottom and started to rally from that point on. It got 410 as support and then it got 416 as support by the end of the day. Now, is this action bullish or bearish? The answer is clear. 
It is bullish. But is it gonna last? Well, that's up for debate. That depends on the payrolls tomorrow. It depends on the hiccups along the way. We got the payrolls, then we got the CPI. But if it all goes good, this rally has enough fuel to go all the way to 430, which is the equivalent of 4300 in the SPX. And that would be a good point for a pause, if not a reversal. But for now, the support is 416 the resistance at 422. Here is the daily chart for the continuous contract for the SPY, the S&P 500. We now have a confirmation that 4,100, 4,102 in my chart is solid support for now, absent of any surprise out of the payrolls. So the target for now is, if all goes good, is 4,232. That would be resistance number one. And then of course we have 4,300. That would be my target if we go there fast to take profits and perhaps think about opening shorts. For now, the volume is down. The momentum indicators are moving higher. All good for the bulls. Nothing to worry about here until the payrolls come out, of course. Are the bears shorting at all? Not at all. You gotta wait for more confirmation. You gotta wait for the law loss of 4,100 of support, and you need to see 3,960 loss to support, better yet 3,855. So this is a long way to go for the bears to initiate serious shorts committing a large amount of capital. For now, you trade these dips on day-to-day -day basis. You buy puts when you see signs of weakness. The chart goes down. You look for support. And by the end of the day, you close these puts. And remember, always be closing at least for now. Here's the SPX, the cash index for the S&P 500. So far, so good. It is above 4,114.64. Nothing to see here. The chart looks bullish. The bulls are in control here. They got the volume down. They got the momentum indicators moving higher. There is no sign of a reversal at all. Now the payrolls might change that, but until we see it, there's nothing to go against here. Of course, if the chart moves higher again, we're waiting for 4,300. That would be my profit target, taking target, excuse me, and then perhaps the shorting target. We'll talk about that when we get there. Here's the Qs, the NASDAQ 30 minutes chart. It went down along with all charts, a gap down in the morning. But guess what? The dip buyers showed up right away. They got us above 307.41. Not only that, but they got us above 313, the notorious Mrs. 313, and now she's standing a support for this chart. But watch out, the gravity of 313 is immense. So if this chart goes higher to the next resistance at around 316, Mrs. 313 will not be happy about that, and she's going to pull the chart down. Here's the daily chart for the continuous contract for the NASDAQ. The chart bounced higher. Now we have 12,766 of support. So far, so good for the bulls. The volume is down. The momentum indicators are moving higher. No problems here at all. We start to have a problem if the payrolls come out disappointing. And by disappointing, we mean harder. We're not seeing job losses. We're not seeing response in the economy by the Fed action so far. But from a technical perspective, the bears are not going to get excited again until we see 12,207 loss to support. Here's the IWM 30 minutes chart. This one was a lot stronger than the Qs and the SPY from the get-go. And it managed to outperform today. And it got us above 188, an important support, a critical one. So this is a massive win for the IWM bulls yet you gotta wait for the payrolls that would be the confirmation but if that happens we have resistance at 191 and a half but closing the week with the support of 188 is a massive win for the Russell 2000 bulls but here's the most important chart the Dixie the daily chart because if the Dixie goes higher tomorrow there goes the rebound there goes the rally goodbye because the reason in my opinion for the rally that we got today is the fact that the dollar went down in the last couple of days we've seen muted activities to negative activities in the stock market and the reason is the dixie moved higher now the dixie is moving down but can you trust tricky dixie of course not there's a reason why we call it tricky dixie it plays dead and then it pops higher right away and if that happens tomorrow we will see a pause in the rally perhaps a reversal so watch out for the dollar index but here's gold and remember gold is the mature guy in the room gold will not rally without having the comfort and the certainty that the dollar is going to go down hence we saw the dollar moving down yet gold being shy not rallying in an excessive way today we saw a massive pop in gold so is this a message by gold the mature guy in the room saying forget it the dixie is going down it's going to lose 100 of support if that is the case then we have higher highs for gold because the chart 
kept the support, the Fibonacci support, and it made a lower high for now. Here is the 4 hours chart for UK oil, Brent. The reverse ABC pattern that we talked about in yesterday's video played out. We got a rebound exactly from the trend line in yellow, and it got us above 114 once again, and now the chart is battling 118 as resistance. If that battle is won by Brent's chart, we will see 120 once again, and perhaps all the way to 125. Here is the US 10 year yield from a daily chart perspective. The bounce from 2.72 as support continues, but it stalled, at least for now. And this is good enough for the NASDAQ, for the high beta, high valuation names to rebound higher. You got the dollar down and you got the 10 year yield cooling down, consolidating. That's good enough, a recipe for a rally. But if the payrolls come out disappointing, it doesn't matter if it is disappointing for you and I or for Jerome Powell or Biden or whoever, it doesn't matter. If it disappoints the stock market, we see the 10 year yield moving higher again. And in my opinion, that would be if we get another hot reading, if we don't see damage in the jobs market, because the Fed is betting that the psychology game will do the job for them. They don't have to increase interest rates by a lot if we see unemployment moving higher. Not by a lot, of course, but just by a little bit because that would be evidence that the job market is responding to the Fed's action. But if we see a hot reading, in my opinion at least, we will see this chart, the 10-year yield, popping higher again, suggesting that the Fed has not done enough and they have to do more when it comes to raising interest rates. And that's not going to be good for the Nasdaq. Here's the TLT weekly chart. Any update here? Not at all. But tomorrow is going to be a big day for this chart. The VIX, 4 hours chart. What's going on here? It went down all the way to the support of 24.29. Is it going to breach that support or not? That depends on the payrolls and how the market is going to respond. Now, if we see a bounce of 24.29, that would be an ominous sign that the rally in the SPY is about to pause, perhaps reverse. Here's the 4 hours chart for the VXN. It moved down. Not in a significant way, but we're seeing negative momentum on both the RSI and MACD indicators. We're not seeing any sign of a reversal in these indicators. Once you see green impressions in the histogram of the MACD from a 4 hours perspective, you know that the VXN is changing course. If the VXN is changing course, the Qs will also change course to the downside. Here's Apple, a daily chart. It is above 150. Now 150 is support. But we have resistance at the trend line in yellow, as you can see in the channel. If that's beaten, then we have 157 as the next resistance. The shorts are not going to jump in unless we see 145 loss to support. And then we see closing of the gap and a failure to bounce higher. Here's Tesla from a 30 minutes chart. What's going on here? The bear flag played out in the morning. Tesla was down by more than 2%. And then the dip buyers showed up not just in Tesla, but across the queues. And it felt like a risk on mode. Who knows why? Does it matter? Maybe the commentary from Brain Dead. Maybe the market now says, okay, the Fed is going to be serious about tackling inflation. We'll see about that. But for now, the chart is forming a bull black pattern, indicating higher highs. But mind you, we have a bump on the road. That is the payrolls. If the payrolls out of the picture, then you will see Tesla popping higher again. The bad news is we have the CPI next week. So again, even if you're playing this bounce, always be closing if you're playing it via call options. And lastly, tulips, BTC, what's going on here? This is perhaps the only bad news that we have for the bulls because the fact that Bitcoin did not participate in the rally in a significant way, that tells us that we are not in a risk on mode. Bitcoin says this is risk off still. Bitcoin, ironically speaking, is the mature guy in the room now, is the conservative asset, saying whatever the stock market is doing right now, I'm not feeling it. Matter of fact, the pop over the weekend faded right away. And now we're looking at 30,000 as support. Is this a hidden message by Bitcoin. We'll see. If we see the stock market moving down tomorrow in a significant way, then you'll know that Bitcoin was your leading indicator. And lastly, moving on to the conclusion of this video. What do we have on the economic calendar tomorrow? In case you were asleep throughout the video, we have the non-farm payrolls, the unemployment rate. This will be highly important. And then we have the services PMI, the ISM services index. We have day number two by the Fed vice chair, Mrs. Brain Dead. With that, folks, I'm done here. This is all I got for you for now. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. I will talk to you again tomorrow.